Okay, Roaring Twenties. So in the 1920 census, more than half of the American population lived in urban areas. And the culture of cities was based on popular tastes, morals, and habits of mass consumption that were increasingly at odds with the strict religious and moral codes of rural America. So as for the jazz age, we have high school and college youth rebelling against previous generations by dancing to jazz music. An example of this is Duke Ellington, which I suggest you listen to. Now, this is a long clip. As for entertainment, we have radio. In 1920, we have the first commercial radio station. And by 1930, we have over 800 stations broadcasting to 10 million radios, which is about a third of all U.S. homes. A network of radio stations were created coast to coast. We have the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, which, yes, that is NBC Channel 4 or whatever channel it is for you. Um, Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, same thing as today. Uh, as for Hollywood, we have the growth of Hollywood and Greta Garbo and Rudolph Valentino. Um, movie theater palaces were built for the general public. Um, those are like theaters. In 1927, we have talking pictures where now we have sound instead of just silent films. Role models are now larger than life personalities from sports and entertainment. Jack Dempsey was a famous boxer. Gertrude Erde... Adair, yeah, you know me. It was a swimmer. Jim Thorpe was a football player. Babe Ruth, obviously baseball. Bobby Jones, golf. And Charles Lindbergh flew nonstop across the Atlantic from Long Island to Paris and became famous for that. Most middle class women were expected to spend their lives as homemakers and mothers. And now we have the increase of labor-saving devices like the washing machine and the vacuum cleaner, which eased but did not substantially change the daily routines of the homemaker. And we also now have sliced bread, also making things a little easier but not really changing the daily routines very much. Women in the labor force remain the same as before the war. They usually lived in cities and were limited to certain categories of jobs like clerks, nurses, teachers, and domestics, a.k.a. like house cleaners, um, nannies, stuff like that. They received lower wages than men. I know we're totally shocked by that revelation. As for society, we now have public assistance for the elderly, public health clinics for people who are sick. We have a new sense of independence for women and this jazz age. We have this revolution in morals where people are revolting against sexual taboos. Uh, Sigmund Freud was an Austrian psychiatrist who stressed the role of sexual repression in mental illness. A lot of his stuff has been like debunked, but definitely one of the forefront leaders of this psychology movement. We now see premarital sex. We have movies, novels, automobiles, and new dance steps like oh, the Foxtrot and the Charleston, which encouraged greater promiscuity. Um, we also have the use of contraceptives was still against the law, but now we have Margaret Sanger who advocated for birth control and also achieved growing acceptance in the 1920s. Um, the birth rate dropped at faster rates in the 1920s. And Margaret Sanger created the first birth control clinic in the U.S. in 1916. It became the um, preemptor to Planned Parenthood. For fashion, um, we have this flapper look where we see ankles now and shortened skirts, shortened hair. This was influenced by movie actresses. Um, dresses were hemmed at the knee. Uh, hair was cut short, as you can see in the picture. Women smoked cigarettes. They drove cars. Um, high school and college graduates took office jobs until they got married. 
there was this expectation of women to lose the flapper look, quit their jobs and settle down as wives and mothers once that they got married. Uh, this whole flapper thing just shocked anybody who was older than that generation. As for divorce, state lawmakers were now forced to listen to feminists. And we have liberalized divorce laws, which allowed women to escape abusive and incompatible husbands. One in six marriages ended in divorce by 1930, compared to one in eight by 1920. So that's growing quite a bit. As for education, we now have mandatory school laws where we have universal high school. And by the end of the 1920s, the number of high school graduates doubled to over 25% of the school age young adults. So this is why you're stuck in high school till you graduate. Um, we have widespread education, which meant literate citizens, but it took mass media to shape a mass culture. So newspapers increased dramatically and magazines flourished. We have mass media, movies, and spectator sports playing important roles in creating popular culture. We now have Mickey Mouse with Disney and King Tut was discovered in Egypt. As for literature during this time, we have themes where religion was scorned as hypocritical, sacrifices of the wartime were fraud perpetrated by money interests. Gertrude Stein called writers of the time the lost generation. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis all wrote novels. Uh, Lewis focused on ridiculing American conformity and materialism. Fitzgerald was showing the negative side of the 1920s, that even the wealthy had hollow lives. And Hemingway criticized the glorification of war. Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot wrote poems, and Eugene O'Neill wrote plays. As for art and architecture during this time period, we have the Art Deco style. Uh, the Chrysler and Empire State Buildings were huge skyscrapers built in New York City in the Art Deco style. As for art, we have Edward Hopper, who, inspired by the architecture of American cities, explored loneliness and isolation in urban life. Grant Wood and Thomas Hart Benton celebrated rural people and scenes of the heartland. Um, on the stage, Jewish immigrants played a major role in the development of the American musical theater. George Gershwin was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants. He blended jazz and classical music in his symphonic Rhapsody in Blue and Porgy and Bess. So these are images of the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, and you can see the Art Deco style on the right side. As for the Harlem Renaissance, almost 20% of African Americans lived in the North in 1930, but they were still facing discrimination. I mean, just because they weren't in the South didn't mean they weren't discriminated against. The largest African American community developed in the Harlem section of New York City. They had a population of almost 200,000 people. And in Harlem, we have a concentration of talented actors, artists, musicians, and writers. So poets like County Cullen, Langston Hughes, James Weldon Johnson, Claude McKay, they all commented on the African-American heritage and their poetry expressed a range of emotions from bitterness and resentment to joy and hope. We also see jazz musicians like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, blues singers like Bessie Smith, Paul Robeson, who is an actor and singer, and they performed in front of integrated audiences, so both white, black, whatever, in Harlem, and then segregated audiences throughout the rest of the nation. Marcus Garvey focused on bringing the United Negro Improvement Association um, from Jamaica to Harlem. He advocated individual and racial pride for African Americans, and he developed political ideas of black nationalism. Uh, he established an organization for black separatism, economic self-sufficiency, and a back to Africa movement. A lot of African American leaders, including W.E.B. Du Bois, disagreed with Garvey's back to Africa idea, but endorsed his emphasis on racial pride and self-respect. This also ultimately led to an influence of black pride and nationalism in the 1960s civil rights movement. As for religion, we have modernism, which took a historical and critical view of certain passages of the Bible. They believed they could accept Darwin's theory of evolution without abandoning religion. And they were influenced by the changing role of women, the social gospel movement, and scientific knowledge. Fundamentalists 
was the other division in Protestantism. Uh, Protestant preachers condemned the modernists and taught that every word of the Bible must be accepted as literally true. A key point of this was creationism, this idea that God created the universe in seven days, as stated in the book of Genesis. They blamed the liberal views of modernists for causing a decline in morals. We have revivalists of the 1920s preaching fundamentalist messages using mass communication through the radio. Billy Sunday attacked drinking, gambling, and da uh, dancing. Um, and then Amy Semple McPherson condemned the twin evils of communism and jazz music from her pulpit in Los Angeles. The Scopes Trial. So Tennessee outlawed the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution in public. The American Civil Liberties Union persuaded John Scopes, a Tennessee biology teacher, to teach the theory of evolution to his high school class. He was arrested and put on trial in 1925. Clarence Darrow was a famous lawyer who defended Scopes. And then William Jennings Bryan on the other side represented the fundamentalists, and he testified as an expert on the Bible. A lot of Southern states ultimately outlawed Darwin's teachings. Scopes was convicted, but it was overturned later on a technicality. The Northern press asserted that Darrow and the modernists had thoroughly discredited fundamentalism and laws banning the teaching of evolution remained on the books for years, although they were rarely enforced. Um, you still see things like this today. I mean, look at that headline from 2014, teachers oppose Virginia bill challenging mainstream science. Prohibition during this time, the 18th amendment was established in 1919 prohibiting the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, including liquors, wines, and beers. Um, speakeasies were bars in cities where bootleg or smuggled liquor was sold, and city police and judges were paid to look the other way. President Harding, the guy sitting in the Oval Office, served alcoholic drinks to guests in the White House, and then liquors, beers, and wines were available from bootleggers who smuggled them from Canada or made them in garages and basements. Um, they were called bootleggers because they would stick the bottle of alcohol in their boot to avoid detection. Um, a good way to remember prohibition, 18th amendment used to be the drinking age, isn't anymore. Used to be illegal to drink, 18th amendment. So if you look at these images, you can see on the top left what I was talking about with the liquor bottle in the boot. Um, and then you can see that women frequently campaigned lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours um, because they are afraid that the ills of society were brought about by liquor. Al Capone led a Chicago gang who fought for control of the lucrative bootlegging trade and organized crime became big business. There were millions of dollars made from the sale of illegal booze, which allowed gangs to expand to other illegal activities like prostitution, gambling, and narcotics. You know, gateway drug there. Most Republicans publicly supported prohibition, but in private, many of them still drank. It's one of those luxuries of being rich, I guess. The Democrats were divided on the issue. Southerners supported it. Northern city politicians called for a repeal of prohibition. Supporters pointed to declines in alcoholism and alcohol-related deaths as ways to prove that it was succeeding. As the years passed, growing public resentment and clear evidence of increased economic activity um, kind of turned people's views around. The 21st Amendment was passed in 1933, which repealed the 18th Amendment. Remember, 18 used to be the drinking age, prohibition. 21st Amendment is now the drinking age, made drinking legal again. Immigration slowed down during World War I, but picked back up after the war. Workers were afraid of competition for jobs. This is something that we keep hearing over and over and over again through history. And isolationists wanted limited contact with Europe because they were afraid that immigrants might push for a revolution. So now we have quota laws uh, that severely limited immigration by setting quotas based on your nationality. Um, Canadians and Latin Americans were exempt from any of these restrictions. So we had almost 500,000 Mexicans migrating legally to the Southwest during the 1920s. Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants, and they were convicted in a Massachusetts court of committing robbery and murder. 
Liberals protested that they were innocent and that they had been accused, convicted, and sentenced to die simply because they were poor Italians and anarchists, aka people against all government. After six years of appeals and debate, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed. The KKK had a resurgence in the 1920s. They attracted new members because of the popular silent film, Birth of a Nation, which portrayed the KKK during the Reconstruction as the heroes of Reconstruction. Um, they used modern advertising techniques to grow to nearly 500, 5 million members by 1925. Um, most of its support was brought from lower middle class white Protestants in small cities and towns. The northern branches of the KKK also had hostility against the Catholics, the Jews, the foreigners, and suspected communists. Their tactics for terrorizing and intimidating, including dressing in white hoods to disguise their identity, burning crosses, and applying vigilante justice by punishing victims with whips, tar and feathers, and even a hangman's noose. Tar and feathers means that they would pour hot tar on you and then stick feathers to you. Um, they developed a strong political influence in the 1920s, especially in Indiana and Texas. The majority of native-born white Americans appeared to tolerate the Klan because it vowed to uphold high standards of Christian moral morality and drive out bootleggers, gamblers, and adulterers. But investigative reports in the Northern press revealed that fraud and corruption in the KKK were heavy. Um, in 1925, the Grand Dragon was convicted of murder, and the Klan's influence declined rapidly and membership declined. Now, don't think that they don't still exist. They do. Their capital is in Ohio, which is where the Grand Dragon lives today. As for foreign policy, um, focus on naval disarmament, hoping to stabilize the size of the U.S. Navy relative to other powers. Um focusing on kind of limiting power and respecting one another's territories. The kellogg briand Pact said that almost all nations of the world signed it and a renouncing the aggressive use of force to achieve national ends. It was kind of ineffective because it allowed for defensive wars and it failed to provide for taking action against violators of the agreement, which is kind of like the League of Nations didn't really have any power. As for business and diplomacy, in Latin America, um, the U.S. was afraid of people taking their property, uh, a.k.a. the countries taking their property. So we kind of kept troops in a lot of Latin American nations. And our investments in Latin America doubled between 1919 and 1929. In the Middle East, oil reserves were found in the Middle East, which became a major source of potential wealth. The British oil companies had a head start on it, but the U.S. wasn't far behind them. And now we have increased. As for war debts before World War I, the U.S. was a debtor nation, which means that we imported more than we exported. After World War I, the U.S. was a creditor nation, which means that it lent more than $10 billion to the Allies. Uh, Calvin Coolidge and Warren G. Harding demanded that Britain and France pay back all their war debts, um, obviously Britain and France objected because they claimed they suffered much worse losses than the Americans. Um, the Dawes Plan was a cycle of payments flowing from the U.S. to Germany and from Germany to the Allies, where the U.S. banks would lend Germany a large amount of money to rebuild its economy and pay the war reparations to Great Britain and France. Then Great Britain and France would use those war reparations money to pay the war debts to the U.S., uh, Finland was ultimately the only nation to repay its war debts in full. So that's your Roaring Twenties.